This is ME297, right? No, no, this is uh, Modern Dance 22. Oh, this is Modern Dance 22. We're lucky today to have our dancer be one of our own graduate students. Jason Moore um, was lucky last year to receive a Fulbright Fellowship to study bicycle dynamics at the Technical University of Delft. And uh, last week he gave the uh, Institute of Transportation Studies seminar last Friday where he and another student talked about the culture in, Den uh, in uh, the Netherlands, but also in Denmark. In uh, northwestern Europe, about 30% of the trips are done by bicycle. And uh, today he's going to tell us some of the technical details of the uh, research that he was doing over there to understand how humans uh, ride bicycles. All right, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I was supposed to turn off this other light. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Dr. Hubbard said, I was in the Netherlands last year under a Fulbright grant, and uh, I would recommend you all checking that out. It's a nice mm -hmm. way to get funded to go overseas and work in some weird country and be cultured, uh, along with getting to do some research. Um, I. Uh, I'm a grad student, just like you. I'm actually in the class, so maybe you guys can pass me the sheet too, so I can sign up. But before I get into this, I'm, I'm going to mention a few more things about bicycling in the Netherlands, just to give you uh, over a why. Why did I choose the Netherlands to go study anything related to bicycles? This is a photo in Delft, the city that I lived in, of the train station. That's one of two train stations in a, a city of 100,000 people, and this is about probably less than a quarter of the bikes parked at that one train station. So. The uh, bicycle is an integral part of the transportation systems in the Netherlands, and uh, it's used for 27% of the trips um, uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, that's the highest of any country in the world, actually, as a whole country as a total. Uh, Davis is the bicycling capital of the United States, too. We have about 15% of trips by bicycle, um, and that's the highest in the country, in the state, I mean, in the, in the US, USA. So um, we're a lot lower than that, but uh, still pretty amazing. Uh, we actually have around 40% of trips to campus are by bicycle. So I went to the Netherlands, which is basically the bike mecca of the world, to work with another professor there that was studying bicycle dynamics. And I also got to learn all this fun stuff about transportation and use the bike and train and never have to even get in the car the entire time I was there, which I felt was very pleasant. So if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to share some more things after the talk. But I'm going to get into what I did as my research. Um, first of all, I'll go through a little just general stuff. What, what, am I after? what are we after? What do we want to know about bicycle dynamics? And then I'm going to talk about two sets of experiments that we did with an instrumented bicycle and then motion capture to try to understand what a human does while they're riding a bicycle. So what is the holy grail uh, that we're after? Uh, what it is is to be able to predict the handling qualities of a bicycle. So what is a handling quality? Um, the formal definition, I'll say, is a measure that determines the ease and precision with which a rider may complete a given task. So what we, when we, anytime a human operates a vehicle or other machine, we want it to be easy to control and comfortable. And uh, that's the same with bicycles, automobiles, airplanes, etc. Uh, and it turns out there's little knowledge on how design changes affect how you uh, perceive and feel how a, how a bicycle handles. So the bicycle is getting close to 200 years old, and this graph shows sort of how, from 1818, how it, how it sort of morphed up into what we ride around today. Uh, these are all two-wheel, single-track vehicles, and you know it's a pretty, it's a nice vehicle. It works well. Uh, we can all learn to ride it, but uh, it evolved from two years, 200 years of tinkering, not uh, really any. I would say hard science uh, backing the fundamental dynamics of, of what the, the bicycle does. So we don't really see a big variation in design and alternative designs do not have this luxury of this 200 years of tinkering. So can we make new bicycle designs uh, such as recumbent bicycles where you're laid back or big cargo bicycles that carry more stuff or maybe bicycles that are easier for children or elderly to ride? 
can we manipulate the bicycle designs so that they handle the way we want them to handle uh, for certain ty types of tasks. The other thing is uh, the bicycle is a pretty complex uh, system that could also shed a lot of light on other human and machine interactions. The way we're looking at the problem is uh, in four main groups. The first is the vehicle dynamics. So we want to get a grasp on what is the motion of a bicycle? What is the fundamental motion? And you know, we write our equations of motion and make mathematical models, do experiments, and try to predict how the bicycle moves alone. But when a rider is riding it, you now have a flexibly coupled body that uh, is attached to the bicycle that introduces all kinds of human biomechanics. So we've got to start figuring out, well, how do you model the motion of this human's uh, flexible movement uh, with like rigid body type of um, uh, dynamics analysis? Thirdly, uh, there's a manual control aspect, and this means uh, what is a human control system? A human control system can't necessarily do exactly what a computer control system, like our sort of ideal feedback control models that we come up with in, in, our, in our classes and stuff, but uh, there are some limitations. There's time delays. We have to move our limbs uh, that uh, don't react you know, instantaneously, <coughs> that other machines and things. So you have to figure out how to model what the control system of the human actually is, what its limitations and advantages are. And finally, if we know all three of these things and get a sort of grasp on them, maybe we can start predicting handling qualities and connecting how we change the vehicle dynamics or even maybe manipulate the human's dynamics such that we um, get desirable handling qualities and maybe come up with prediction tools to uh, design bicycles such that it performs in a certain dynamic way. Uh, there's a few things that we know about the fundamental bicycle dynamics. Not a lot. The first is that some bicycles are stable at various speeds. So um, if you try to knock the bicycle over, it's going to ride itself and come back uh, to its uh, normal position. Second one is that steering into the lean will stabilize a bicycle. This is very similar to when you try to balance a broomstick on your hand. If the, bis if the broom leans to the left, you have to move the contact point up under it to the left. And that's the same with the bicycle. If you're leaning to the left, you have to steer to the left to, to, to ride it. And finally, to initiate, uh, for example, a right turn where you'd want to be in a rightward lean, you have to steer to the left first. And this is another fundamental um, part of the dynamics of the bicycle. So there's a model that um, we can design, a rigid body, multi, uh, multi body model called the Whipple model after a guy that came up with it about a in 1899, actually, uh, that predicts these things. <clears throat> four, it has four rigid bodies, the two wheels, a frame, and a fork. And they're all attached with each other by frictionless revolute joints. Uh, the wheels roll without slip on a flat ground plane and, have no, uh, and are assumed to be knife-edged. Uh, it's an uncontrolled system. And finally, there's about 25 parameters that describe the geometry, mass, mass location and mass distribution of the system. So uh, furthermore, uh, we can describe the configuration of the bicycle with eight generalized coordinates. There's one holonomic constraint associated with the fact that the two, ground, the two uh, contact points at the wheels have to be touching the ground uh, at the same time. And there's four non-holonomic constraints associated with the fact that uh, we're assuming no slip at the wheel, so zero velocity at the contact point in the ground plane. With that, we're left with a three degree, three degree of freedom model uh, where we typically choose the steer, the lean of the rear frame, and the rear wheel rates as the uh, dependent generalized speeds. You can take this model and uh, linearize it about the upright constant forward speed situation. And you get some equations that look like this. You have a uh, mass, a damping type like matrix, and a spring type matrix. And you can see that V now, uh, we've turned it into a parameter uh, because we're assuming constant speed. You can pull those out of uh, these two uh, entries in the in this damping and spring matrix along with gravity. And now it's a two degree of freedom linear model with uh, steer, angle and roll angle and their rates uh, as the generalized coordinates, the, the two degrees of freedom. 
And what this model starts to predict um, are some of these things that uh, I talked about a minute ago, the fundamentals of the bike dynamics. Uh, it predicts three modes of motion. Um, one is an oscillatory motion and then two um, <clears throat> non-oscillatory motions. And I'm going to show a graph that sort of clues you into what those actually are. And it predicts this bicycle stability that I talked about. And for an average bicycle, it turns out that's sort of around 7 to 11 miles per hour. So this graph is a little complicated to look at in the first go around. But what I'm plotting <coughs> is the, the eigenvalues on the y-axis versus speed, this parameter that we introduced uh, by linearizing the model. Uh, we've got speed in kilometers here. We've got the real parts of the eigenvalues, the values on the left-hand axis. On the right-hand axis, the imaginary parts of the eigenvalues. The real eigenvalues are plotted in a solid uh, line, and the imaginary part with, of the corresponding color is plotted in a dotted line. So first of all, I mentioned this caster mode of motion. We can see this. Uh, Ne the area at the bottom is negative, and if you remember from your controls class, negative um, eigenvalues means that we have a stable system. So the caster um, mode associated with this eigenvalue is, uh, is, has to do with the fact that the front wheel of a bicycle is like a caster on a, on a chair. It always writes itself in whatever the direction you're, you're going, and that's always stable. The capsize mode here is um, stable at low speeds but becomes unstable at high speeds and this uh, mode of motion uh, has to do with just the leaning of the whole frame over a slow, um, well not necessarily slow but uh, just associated with the lean angle of the frame. Finally the weave motion is a little more interesting. At very low speeds it, uh, we have two real eigenvalues and they're, un they're neg I mean positive so they're unstable and this predicts sort of a pendulum-like motion of a bicycle. It just falls down. But as speed increases, these eigenvalues coalesce into an imaginary pair. And uh, this dotted blue line shows the, the frequency uh, of, of the pair and the real part. But the real part eventually goes positive, I mean negative, and we have a, a stable system. And this is associated with the, um, the lean, lean of the bike and the steer of the bike. Um, uh, leaning and steering out of phase of each other in an oscillatory fashion. And what it ends up, is, ends up showing is that we have this stable speed range. There's one point where all the eigenvalues are negative and we have a um, stable system. So if we have this ideal situation of this linear model, we can push the bicycle up to, in this case, above 16 miles, uh, kilometers per hour, try to perturb it, and it'll ride itself back to the constant forward upright uh, position that we started with. So I'm going to show a couple of simulations that uh, give you an idea what these motions are. Um, I'm showing the same plot over here, but I'm going to give you a vertical black line that uh, indicates which speed we're at. The first one is simply uh, at zero speed, and like I said, it's like an inverted pendulum. We will simply see when it's perturbed, and the bicycle falls over as expected. It's an unstable system. The um, <clears throat> If we go a little faster, uh, we're now in this um, section, uh, we're past the speed that uh, we have this oscillatory motion, but we're still at the unstable eigenvalue. So this, this simulation will show that um, we start it up, we're at the speed, we perturb it, it weaves, and eventually um, ex it uh, expands and the bicycle's unstable and it falls down. Now. If I go just a, a little bit faster past this uh, s critical speed, critical weave speed, and below the critical capsize speed, I'm in the stable range. So this video isn't as distinct in the weave motion, but if you watch closely, it weaves slightly with the same perturbation, uh, but comes back to the upright configuration. So it leaves just a little when you perturb it, comes back to upright. So we have a stable, stable system. Finally, if we go above the capsize critical speed, we have an unstable system with a very small real eigenvalue part. And uh, this video will sort of show that motion. It's, it's like a slow, slowly decaying um, uh, fall of the, the lean angle of the bike. It just takes a while. It's, this eigenvalue, uh, the real part's so small that you know, it's very easy for a human to control. And we usually don't worry about this too much. It's more the weave critical speed that has more effects on the, on the handling of the system. 
So I showed you these simulations, this linear model, does this happen in real life? Well, this video is going to show a, a bicycle being pushed up to speed. A uh, guy's going to run along it, hit it, perturb it, and we're going to see what happens. <clears throat> he pushes the bicycle, hits it, it weaves and wobbles like we saw in the video, but comes back up to the upright vertical speed. So we can see clearly in this simple experiment that the bicycle exhibits this um, inherent stability. Another cool thing is uh, you can manipulate the dynamics of the, of the bicycle such that at even very low speeds you can't practically knock this bicycle down. It's almost you know, barely going. This is 0 .0, 0 .0, 0.1 miles an hour or something. Uh, and it doesn't fall down. And this has a, um, and wh why does it do this? It has a extra flywheel spinning in the front wheel. <clears throat> and this is a product that's going to come out for children to learn to ride bicycles easier, or anybody to learn to ride bicycles easier. So he still has the same dynamics of the bicycle, but uh, has this more, more stability property uh, due to the uh, extra gyroscopic forces. The other thing was this weird thing where you have to turn left to go right that I mentioned at the beginning. This is a video that I think clearly um, shows that. This is my colleague in Delft. We have a video camera mounted on the front of the bicycle showing what the rider does, uh, showing the view relative to the rear frame of the bicycle. And if you keep an eye on either the handlebars or the front fender and watch the way the uh, way he turns the bike, we'll see what happens. Uh, he's going to make a right-hand turn. It's going to happen three times in case you miss it. So you can see clearly he turns to the left to go right. Turns to the left to go right. And this is a fundamental um, property of the dynamics of the bike. If you're using a steer as an input, you have to do this to make a left-hand turn. You have to turn right first to make a left-hand turn. <clears throat> So I've talked all about this stability issue, you know, is it beneficial for handling? One interesting, couple of interesting, interesting things to note is that um, the Wright Flyer's first airplane, um, <clears throat> when they had these gliders that were very, very stable, you know, they designed some of their first planes like this, they weren't really controllable. So it wasn't until they made an unstable aircraft that they actually were able to control the plane and fly it. Uh, it's the same with fighter jets, they're, they're very unstable systems and uh, they use complex control, human in loop control systems to allow uh, you to stabilize it, but they have great maneuverability because um, the stability is, uh, you don't have much stability. Same with race cars, uh, when you're uh, going around a turn extreme, in extreme situations, you know, they're on the verge of stability, but they may provide more handling and more maneuverability at this time. So, the point is, is that stability does not necessarily equate to ease of control, which is this handling quality thing that is the holy grail that we'd really want to know. <clears throat> but it does affect it. And um, one question is, are the uncontrolled dynamics an indicator of handling? So these kind of dynamics I just showed you, that eigenvalue power, can you get any information about handling out of it? Well. It has been done for aircraft. They've made connections between um, <clears throat> open loop, uncontrolled uh, linear dynamics of an aircraft and how a pilot perceives the handling of the vehicle. And we may be able to do something that, like that with the bicycle, except the bicycle, I think, is a bit more complicated because the rider's motions affect the dynamics of the bike much more than in a plane or a car where the, where the rider, uh, the, the, the steering input or the gas and stuff are the only inputs. Here, any time you move a limb, it could eventually affect the dynamics of the vehicle. Uh, uh, with aircraft, too, there's been uh, manual control theory, and that's, like, that's uh, human-in-the-loop control theory that has provided more insight to how uh, handling qualities relate to the dynamics of a vehicle. And this is the kind of thing that we want to start to look at for bicycles. <clears throat> so how do we control a bicycle? I like this video. A lot of you may have seen it on YouTube. But this is Danny McCaskill. He's a pro trials rider. And he's going to attempt to ride his bike across the top of this fence. Um, <clears throat> keep an eye on his body and just see you know, what kind of things he does to make that happen. You can see he's off, this, off the saddle. He's going to wiggle his butt around a lot. He's hopping around. He uses the steer as input, but his knees are flopping around and everything. At the end, he throws out a leg to balance, and he makes it across. <clears throat> so I think this demonstrates how complex it can be to control a bicycle. And as a human, we can use lots of different uh, inputs besides just the steer or, or leaning or something. <clears throat> 
but obviously we don't do this in sort of our everyday ride to school. We, um, we don't really do all these crazy actions. But if you've got to avoid a wreck or something, you may, you may do something of that nature. So the obvious control inputs that we always talk about is steer. You know, you can easily control your bike by manipulating the steer angle. If you take your hands off the bike, maybe you're leaning or something relative to the bike. I don't, I don't really know, but those are the two things you think of. But this video, you know, shows that maybe there's other things like upper body twist, arm movements, leg movements, shifting on the saddle. Um, there's all kinds of things that could be happening, but what we wanted to do in these experiments that I did at Delft was objectively observe and measure what a rider does in sort of normal bicycling situations. So we came up, we built a, the first experience we did, experiments we did were uh, with this instrumented bicycle. It has a data onboard data acquisition system uh, that uh, is capable of basically measuring all the states of the bicycle. Uh, that would that are could be mapped to this model that we that I showed you previously, and the other cool thing was this uh, camera on the front. Um, it's mounted to the rear frame, so that gives you a camera view of what the rider is doing relative to the rear frame of the bicycle. Uh, we did various things. We just simply rode it around town and recorded the data and see what happens then when you're just riding normally, not really thinking about things. And then we also took it to a more controlled environment. There's this awesome treadmill in uh, the Free University in Amsterdam. It's three by five meters that you can ride a bike, you can move around a lot, and uh, it was a perfect um, environment to do these controlled uh, bicycle experiments. We did things such as pedaling, just normal pedaling, keeping the bicycle straight, no pedaling uh, by tying a rope to the front of the bike, riding with no hands, perturbing the bicycle, introducing, uh, tying a string to the seat, jerking it, and then letting a person uh, straighten back out, and lane change maneuvers. And we measured the bicycle dynamics and then had all this video data where we could see what the rider is doing. So this is a video here of my professor uh, starting off at about 18 miles an hour. And the speed is going to drop, and just keep an eye on like how much the steering moves, how much his body moves. At high speeds, you see the pedaling, a lot of pedaling motion, his body sort of swaying with the pedaling. Not a lot going on with the steering, though. And remember that this, frame, this uh, camera frame is relative to the rear frame of the bicycle. So as we get pretty slow, this is getting you know, two miles per hour or so, one, getting closer to one. Uh, we don't see a lot of movement of the upper body relative to the rear frame, but the steering starts to increase a lot. And then we're going to drop down from uh, getting closer to one mile per hour. Uh, the steering is increasing a lot. We're using a lot of steering to keep the bike upright. But another cool thing we notice, if you keep an eye on his knees, he's moving those sort of laterally a lot too. And so maybe the knees are, keep, are, are uh, helping you control the bicycle low speed. but. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of upper body motions that are, that are helping out. So we came up with a few conclusions from these experiments. Uh, no visual signs of upper body lean, like I showed. The steering frequency was sort of dominated by the pedaling frequency in these ones where we, you pedal. The steering amplitude is inversely proportional to the speed. As you decrease speed, you have to make larger and more f and uh, larger steering uh, movements to control the bicycle. At low speeds, the rider exhibited these knee motions and uh, well, the final thing we came up with was, uh, okay, we got all these videos, but we don't have any numbers like engineers want to see. So there was no e easy way to quantify how much the rider is moving and what the kinematics are all about. So we went back to the treadmill, but this time uh, we set up full body motion capture to measure what the rider mo does and the bicycle dynamics. So we had 31 markers uh, placed on the bicycle and on the human uh, and recorded their location in, in 3D space with a motion capture system. We did similar types of tests that I described and we did multiple riders, multiple bicycles. So. We took all this data from this, these, these riders moving around and stuff, and we had like 150 million data points. So what do you do with that? We uh, decided to use principal component analysis to, as a first go at interpreting and sorting through this massive data we had. Now principal component analysis is a statistical data reduction technique. 
and uh, based on an eigen analysis of data variants. It's used for face recognition, data compression, and we used it because we found some cool papers that were on characterizing human walking with the same techniques. Um, it turns out that when you do this, that you get an, an eigenvalue that will correspond to the largest variance in motion. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what that's all about. We had 31 markers, like I said, mapped in 3D space, so they each had three coordinates. You map in time. That's 93 different time series for every single run. Well, this is just a, uh, we're thinking about one marker and moving in planar motion where we have an X and a Y coordinate. Is this thing working? Yeah. X and a Y coordinate mapped in time uh, along the row uh, that tells you the position of this marker. Well, you can calculate the covariance of the mean subtracted data of this uh, data set. And what you can do with that is you can now describe any instance in time of these new data points uh, with this equation, which is the average position of the data points plus two vectors multiplied by these varying time coefficients. And it turns out these vectors are the eigenvectors of that covariance matrix that we described. And the eigenvalue tells you, the eigenvalue associated with each eigenvector tells you which of these components has the largest variance in motion. So we did this for the, uh, the data we had, but we needed a way to sort of visualize it. This is a GUI uh, that we made up so you could, vi you could put up two different runs for comparison. Uh, you can look at vi different views from the front to back, a 3D view, etc. You can look at the bicycle alone, the rider alone, or both of them together as shown. Uh, you can play it forward, reverse it, you can speed it up, you can pause it, etc. But the main thing is, is that over here on each side of the um, pictures are the top ten principal components that we got from this uh, data crunching. And you can turn them on or off. And it also lists the, the percent variance beside that so you know how much uh, of the total motion of the system is associated with that particular principal component. Um, yeah, I think it's all about that. So uh, I'm going to give an example of sort of how we looked at the data and what it, what it sort of shows us. This uh, is just a run uh, at 15 kilometers an hour, about 10, kilometer, 10 miles an hour or so, I guess, uh, that I'm just riding the bike normally, pedaling, trying to keep the uh, bike at a forward heading. <clears throat> now. The picture on the right, I've got the first uh, principal component turned on. And when I start to play it, it's going to show what that first component is. The first component turns out to be just the lateral drift of all the markers back and forth on the treadmill. The second component is, has something to do with pedaling. We can see this vertical component, the pedaling motion, and also notice the upper body is sort of moving uh, with this, comp this component too. Third component is also a pedaling component. Uh, it's another linear, sort of horizontal pedaling component. If you turn these on together, you sort of get the whole pedaling motion that we're accustomed to, to seeing. And uh, notice too, the upper body has this sway that's uh, in frequency with the pedaling. If I uh, turn on the fourth one, this turns out to be the longitudinal drift, um, more clearly on the uh, from the top of the bike chicks moving back and forth on the treadmill. The fifth component uh, is a yaw type of motion of the entire system. So it sort of picks out this yawing motion, which is one of the fundamental motions we see in the bike dynamics. The sixth component is a component that shows sort of steer. You see the steer of the bike. It's getting, things are getting smaller because we're going down in principal components. And actually a little bit of lean of the bicycle. We can turn on five and six together and you get this combination of yaw, lean, and steer, which uh, they're linked dynamically in the equations of motion of a bicycle. So that's sort of, you can see how they're connected. Show one more. Uh, this was an interesting one. We get this knee bouncing type phenomena, which 
What, what the hell is that? Well, it's either it, ha it happens at twice the frequency of the pedaling motion. And I think it's either that we had the ankle flexion, the ankles were loose and could move, or something to do with the force at every every pedal motion. So you look through all these things and you, s you can characterize different motion types. So we were then able to uh, characterize these uh, motions and sort of and group them. And I don't get I haven't gotten into the details of grouping them, but there's some mathematical ways to sort of group them too. Uh, but we came up for the normal pedaling, like I showed you, these main groups, steer, roll, and yaw. Uh, then a pedaling group, which includes the pedaling in the legs, but also this upper body movement, uh, leaning, sort of a spine bend, uh, twisting. They're all in the same frequency and that were grouped um, with the pedaling motion. Finally, we've got these sort of lateral knee motions too that show up, uh, like we saw on the video data, and then <clears throat> the knee bounce uh, that I just showed too. Um, some of the things we did with this data was, well, how do these motion groups change with speed if we look at every different run at the different speeds? And this graph shows, uh, for instance, <coughs> pedaling. Uh, the, the, this is the percent variance on uh, on the y-axis, and notice I've got two scales for the gray lines. That's at 10 percent, and this is 100 percent for the uh, black lines. Pedaling starts out uh, very low variance at uh, low speed, so you're not doing much pedaling mo movement relative to the other motions um, at uh, low speed. But as you increase speed, you rapidly see that you see that, ra that pedaling rapidly becomes the dominant motion in the system. Uh, the uh, steer roll and yaw of the of the system starts out very high. You know that's the dominant motions at low speed and rapidly decreases at uh, high speed, where it's practically no motion associated with these. The bike sort of rock rock solid. Uh, then we see that knee bounce is relatively high at low speeds and decreases as we go um, to higher speeds. And the lateral knee motions. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The knee bounce sort of stays constant across speed. The lateral knee motions that I said could possibly be uh, controlled at low speeds are high at low speeds and low uh, as you increase speed. This, um, the other thing too is that we were trying to look at is, well, what are actually the control motions, okay? How can, if we took this data with pedaling in it, how do you sort of extract what is actually control and what is just reactions to pedaling? Uh, you can sort of do this by looking at this data and turning off those components associated with pedaling. Right now, all the pedaling motion is on, but I'm going to slowly turn off the components in the video. And you can see now in the low speed one that uh, we have no pedaling motion, but we have lots of steer uh, and, and roll and yaw and all these bike dynamic motions. We even have the, you can watch the knees moving around some. Then at high speed, it's totally different. The thing's sort of rock solid um, without the pedaling. You don't see much steering, roll, yaw, etc. The knees are not doing much moving, and the upper body is not moving either. And sort of both in both cases, basically. So we think that maybe the control actions are definitely more associated with the steer uh, versus other body inputs, and maybe some of these these knee motions. Here's another graph to look at. This is simply looking at the steer angle data we took. Uh, the, each of these graphs is a different speed from 2 kilometers an hour up to 30 kilometers an hour. And we're plotting the um, frequency spectrum of the steer angle of the bicycle. Uh, keep it, the y-axis is the amplitude, the x-axis is the frequency that this is happening at, and Keep in mind that the scales are different for each graph. These are 0.5 at the top, 0.02 at the bottom. And this shows that uh, we have some kind of frequency distribution for every <coughs> speed. <clears throat> and as speed increases, we'll see, you can see that things get pretty broad across the spectrum. We don't have like this sort of low frequency dominated like we do in the, in the uh, low speed. But the other thing to note is that these black lines are, are represent what the pedaling frequency is in this in the case, and the black line uh, we see spikes, especially at high speed, where the uh, at the pedaling frequency. So this pedaling frequency is dominating, sort of the what the steer what's happening with the steer angle. Um, 
less so at uh, lower speeds. Also, we were wondering, one of our hypotheses were, are the, if, if an open loop, uncontrolled bicycle stabilizes itself in, this, uh, in a certain eigenfrequency, like I showed you back on these eigenvalue plots, then does the human try to use that same frequency to stabilize the bicycle? Well, this gray line is uh, for each speed is the eigenfrequency for the linear model of that particular bicycle and rider. And we saw no sign of you know, any kind of spikes or anything at the eigenfrequency for any of these. So this told us that maybe the, um, uh, the human does not control the bicycle the same way that the bicycle stabilizes itself. Uh, the graph on the right uh, maybe more clearly shows the um, <clears throat> relationship between steer angle amplitude and speed. As speed increases, uh, steer angle uh, amplitude decreases, basically. So you have to use a lot less steering, and uh, you can rely more on the st stability properties of the bicycle <clears throat> to uh, keep the bicycle stable. So conclusions from these motion capture experiments uh, were that during normal bicycling, the dominant upper body motions, lean, bend, twist, are all linked to the pedaling motion. So we do those, we think, because we're pedaling. pedaling. We also hypothesize that uh, lateral control of the bike is done mainly by steering, since we observe only upper body motion in the pedaling frequencies. <clears throat> Finally, upper body motions are used for control if upper body motions are used for control, then this control is in the pedaling frequency, and we would need to figure out some way to delineate that and find out what that's all about. And then finally, when pedaling at low speeds, we do observe lateral knee motions, which may be used for control too. Uh, and finally, just I want to say some general things that uh, the bicycle is a complex, robust system to. Uh, to explore and, and learn a lot of things about, including vehicle dynamics, uh, rolling contacts, uh, speed dependent stability, lots of fun, fun things there, uh, biomechanics, how, uh, how to model humans with rigid bodies, um, what kind of muscle uh, models you may need to include, uh, locomotion type of things, uh, human control aspect, which we're going to be getting into soon with a, a new uh, grant that we got. Uh, what's, that, what's actually the control system that the humans use when riding a bicycle at different speeds in different situations. And uh, then finally, uh, handling qualities. How does the rider's perception of uh, how the vehicle actually handles and feels tie into all these dynamic stuff that we can calculate and things. So I'll leave you uh, with this video of me riding no-handed at uh, the lowest speed that I possibly could, and you can try to theorize, you know, how do you actually control a bicycle without using the steering as an input uh, by looking at this video. That's my talk, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions at this point. Thank you. Question. Oh, come on. Everybody rides their bike every day. Yeah? Did you ever uh, try riding uh, at the same speed with different gear ratios to see what that did? We did. We took data with uh, different gear ratios. And uh, like I said, I have 150 million data points, and I haven't gone through them all yet. So I can't give you any conclusions on the different gear ratio stuff. Yeah. Leah? What sort of frame geometry did you look at? Did you look at Could you the speak thing? into the mic? Because, oh, yeah. Uh, this is um, did you look at uh, fr effective frame geometry? Uh, we did not look at how um, we didn't. We we rode three different bicycles, I guess, uh, which we can make some comparisons on frame geometry. We uh, got free bicycles from Batavus, which is the maybe the biggest bicycle manufacturer in the Netherlands at this point. Um, and we asked them, give us a bicycle that you think is squirrely and give us a bicycle that you think is a stable bike. So they gave us um, bicycles and they called them, you know, we said, we think this one's squirrely and this is stable. They all had different um, frame geometries, slightly, you know, not major differences. They were all sort of Dutch city bikes. And they also had different masses and distribution of mass, et cetera. So they did have different properties and we can look at, uh, we can, I haven't done this, but we can look at, you know, how this data changes versus bicycle. Uh, all I've done really now so far is look at how uh, it changes versus speed in the pedaling case.
Yeah. Any other things? Everybody knew all this about bicycles, that uh, they were stable and everything? It was easy, yeah? Uh -huh. Okay. You didn't, you didn't try to build unstable bicycles like that physicist did many years ago and find out anybody can ride any bike, practically speaking? Yeah, we, we didn't do that. I mean, we definitely want to figure out that kind of stuff. You know, why is it that uh, the human controller can handle an unstable bicycle? And the, and the thing he's talking about is actually uh, this guy, David Jones, back in the 70s, decided to <clears throat> Um, take a bicycle and he wanted to know if I make a bicycle so it's inherently unstable can a bicycle still and can a rider still control it you know fine and what does that affect and he, and he canceled out the gyroscopic effects by adding extra wheels to the bike so you had no uh, angular momentum uh, basically you had angular momentum cancellation and he also uh, changed geometry of the bicycle such that you had this thing that wouldn't do what that yellow bicycle did it would fall down but people got on the bikes and you can still control it and ride it where you want. It may feel a little awkward, but you can still do that. Um, yeah, we want to find out what, what we can. Right now we start, just started off with normal bicycles and uh, got some that were very a, a little bit different. Um, another thing we did, we had a group of undergraduate students. We had a variable, well, variable geometry bicycle. You could adjust the head tube angle, you could adjust the fork rake, um, the wheelbase, all the th anything you could practically adjust uh, as far as geometry is concerned, and they did these sort of cool handling experience with that. They they would make the bicycle very unstable and put these crazy weights on the uh, front of the bike and make the fork backwards so you'd have a uh, positive trail or positive or negative. Well, anyways, um, and. And when they took it out and had students ride it around in circles and then give ratings, you know, how well this bike performed in doing this little figure eight course they did. And, um, <clears throat> and then connected it with the, they calculated the eigenvalues and bike dynamics and, and made some connections. And, you know, and they, they could see that, you know, the bike with this sort of uh, bad eigenvalues, what we would call bad eigenvalues maybe, they rated worse, you know, the students. So there were some experiments along those lines. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Do you think it might be possible to build a bicycle that's stable without gyroscopic effects? Yes, I do. <laughs> so um, you can calculate these eigenvalues for all kinds of bic bicycles, and I can make that plot. Uh, let me just go back to the uh, real quick. Uh, where is it at? Yeah. You know, you can, you can put in, if you change the geometry of a bike or the mass distribution or any of the parameters of the vehicle, this plot looks different. And <clears throat> this is sort of what it looks like for most normal bicycles. But if I put a recumbent bicycle or I put something with uh, zero radius wheels or I put some or, or a straight up and down uh, steer axis or sort of like more extreme uh, bicycle geometry and mass properties, this thing can be changed extremely and it doesn't look like this sort of standard plot. And you get these crazy eigenvalues. You may have new oscillatory motions. You may have no oscillatory motions and different things like that. But it does turn out that you can predict um, both with the model. You can make a bicycle with uh, no gyroscopic effects and even take away and even make it have, uh, I'm getting negative and positive mixed up. I don't, can't remember our convention. Um, make the trail uh, opposite. So make the caster effect such that um, it's like a caster pointed in the wrong direction <clears throat> and it wants to flip around. You can make it like that and the bicycle still exhibits stability in the linear model. Uh, and uh, we actually were wor worked on a, an experimental device that can show this too. It's sort of a really funky bicycle. It doesn't look like a bicycle, but it has these, these properties that you would think are required for a bicycle to be stable, taken away, and it's still stable. I think the thing to note about that is that there's all these parameters, geometry, mass, mass, uh, uh, mass location, and distribution of mass, and you can manipulate these things and take some of them away and add to them to make the dynamics change drastically and be a different, totally different vehicle. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of the cool thing. There's no, you know, you can't say if you don't have trail or you don't have gyroscopic effects, the bike's not stable. Um, I can change other things about the bike and make it stable. So, yeah. Are 
Other questions before you get on the bicycle? It's your last chance. Well, let me t I'll tell you one thing to try, the counter steering when you leave on your bicycle day, and I hope you all rode bicycles, um, or walked, it's okay, to campus. Uh, when you get on your bicycle, if you want to test the counter steering thing, just put your palms on the, on the handlebars uh, when you're riding, and press it one way, and see which way that you turn, and that'll, sh that'll prove to you that uh, the dynamics of the bicycle force you to counter steer. Don't fall though, or don't blame me. Yeah? Some, um, I mean, I've noticed that, but more on cruiser. Like, I, I've noticed that it's like significantly larger on cruisers uh -huh. as opposed to like I don't know your race bike. Yeah, it, you, you definitely have to do more like left to go right. Uh, is it like somehow related to a handlebar? It, um, yes, because what it has to do with is. Um, if you, if you model a control system for this bike such that you have the steer as the input, <clears throat> you, uh, you get a non-minimum phase system where it means that you have to um, sort of go in the opposite direction first to get back to the stable situation. And <clears throat> the overshoot of the steering you have to do is going to depend on the bicycle's geometry, mass, mass location, and distribution of mass. So depending on which bike you get, um, you may have to do more over counter steering than another uh, as far as uh, you have to do it on all but you may have to do more or less uh, to do the same maneuver I can't pin it down to handlebars but it could it's something to do with these properties your question you, you remember also the, the uh, backward steering motorcycle which uh, was sponsored by the United States government but because it wouldn't have to counter steer but it was it's so, impossible to ride more than six feet without falling over. And we, we've made many of many rear steering bicycles. And, yeah. and uh, it is possible for a human being to do that, but that is a genuinely difficult yeah. job. To control it, you mean? To ride it all without yeah. falling over. Falling over is easy. Maybe you can do it. Yeah, if you, uh, I got five more minutes, I'll talk a little more. If you're riding your bicycle and you get very close to a curb, say, uh, you start to feel really anxious, you know, because you, your body, your brain knows unconsciously that you have to turn into the curb to get away from it. Or if you're at the edge of a road, you know, and you're going to go off it into the ditch or whatever, if you come to that very edge, it starts to get really scary you know, because your body knows that you've got to go out off the edge to come back in. And um, so that rear steer motorcycle that they, he talked about, they designed, was they, they said, well, why shouldn't that be? In, that should be intuitive. Like when you drive a car, if I want to go left, I turn left. Simple as that. That should be the way that it should be for a bicycle or a motorcycle. And they set this motorcycle up with rear steer steering, rear steer, rear, wheels. rear wheel steering, and uh, and then expecting, okay, and then you can turn left to go left. But like he said, you can't ride it more than six feet. And uh, do you guys have a rear steer bike again? Is it so? Maybe you can ask Dr. Carnup if you, he'll let you ride his rear steer bike or, or come to his class. <laughs> cool. Good questions. Okay. Yeah. Question. Okay. Is that like the main thing that people learn when they're learning to ride a two-wheel bike? Is that counter steer? Yeah, I think it's the. Uh, I believe it's yeah. This uh, you, it somehow clicks that you've got to do this counter steering thing, you know, when you get on a bike. I would tell you too, never teach your kids to ride a bike on training wheels. That's why I like this gyro bike thing I showed. Uh, the, the training wheels just sets you up on a tricycle, basically. A tricycle turns like a car. When you turn left, you go left. And when you jump to a real bike, you don't have that intuition. So um, it's better to have a kid, like, lower the seat, let, them, let their uh, feet touch the ground, and they can scoot. And, and feel the dynamics of the bike, this counter steering that they have to do, and they'll learn much, much faster. Or ride on a scooter or something. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the thing that clicks eventually. And you, you, this counter intuition gets mapped to intuition into your brain, and then you can ride it forever. And you practically, you can always ride a bike if you learned it once, I guess. <clears throat> once you learn, you never know how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you never really think about that. But. OK, so let's thank Jason again.